and welcome to another episode of the Dividend Cafe. Uh, very happy to be recording here in the California studio, although actually this will be the last time I'm recording from here for a little while. Uh, there'll be a lot more New York time and some you know, travel and movement and so forth um, over the next month, month and a half. But today's Dividend Cafe um, is very different uh, than the kind of typical course. And I hope, I hope you'll benefit from it. I hope you'll get something out of it. But I um, am doing something on purpose that's a little different today than, than normal. For one thing, I you know, never really rip anybody off. Like, uh, I guess there's various moments of inspiration and whatnot, but you know, all the material we put out is pretty darn uh, freshly originated and sourced. And yet the idea for what I'm going to talk about here today, I absolutely lifted from somebody else. So I'll give all that attribution, but the specifics of it are kind of my own story. And, and just as last week when I was talking about our feelings on the housing market, I kind of walked through some of the, the history of, of my, my early uh, life residential purchases and sales and things. Um, I do have kind of a biographical component to this story, but it's all for the purpose of giving an analogy to an investment theme and an investment priority uh, that is a, a really big deal to us at the Bonson Group. It's something that I've cared about a lot for 15 years and something that I think uh, clients deserve to understand and hopefully those of you that are not invested in, I'll give it away now, the midstream energy space will be able to appreciate because I think you uh, you are missing out on something extraordinary if you're not. Um, so here's what I've lifted. There's a gentleman by the name of Heinz Howard who I've been reading for I think 11 and maybe 12, getting close to 12 years, who writes something called mlpguide.com, but he's a portfolio manager in the infrastructure asset team at CBRE. Um, and and he writes a weekly bulletin. It used to be a free deal. It's now a paid subscription thing. It's not very much, but I've read it every week, literally every single week without exception for ever since it started. And it, I like it a lot. It's good analysis. I think he might be a similar age to me. A lot of his pop culture references he uses when he writes. Uh, he's very clear. He's a Gen Xer like myself. And I... um have benefited from some of his research and analysis as a midstream energy investor. He's writing about MLPs, Master Limited Partnership, and even, and even apart from companies that are maybe not structured as MLPs from a tax and legal entity standpoint, they're in the space of uh, transporting and storing uh, oil and gas in the U.S. energy sector. So, he, about four or five weeks ago now, made an analogy in this huge comeback that's taken place in the midstream energy sector to struggles he's had with his eyesight over his life and how he just got kind of used to having contact lenses. He could see okay, not great. And then one day he got a new doctor, new prescription, and everything was just different. And everything was what it was until it wasn't. Then all of a sudden it was better. So his exact journey is a bit different than mine. But the, the thing I'm lifting is using that analogy in my own life to where I want to go with midstream energy. I um, was diagnosed with a disease called keratoconus uh, right after the time that my, my dad died when, when I was a very young man. And I must have had keratoconus before he died, but we didn't necessarily know. And then the, the acceleration of the disease was really rapid after this diagnosis. So you, your cornea is basically kind of deteriorating because you're, you're getting, um, it's sort of like a blister. You get really, really steep middle part of your cornea and, and it of course alters your vision and could jeopardize the, your eyesight entirely. I was waiting for a donor for quite some time. To, I had to have transplants, basically to save my eyes. My left eye was 10 times legally blind. I could use a really, really weird contact lens that enabled me to functionally see out of my right eye, but it was not safe. It was not good. It was not pleasant. It was painful. And the vision was atrocious. And I just prayed I'd get a donor and they'd heal my eyes. And then I did. I got uh, I had a corneal transplant in 1997 in my left eye and another one in 1999 in my right eye. 
And, and so it, I still had to have glasses. I still, I couldn't wear contacts. Uh, there was too much pain and other issues. The light sensitivity was much higher on the corneal transplanted, the transplanted corneas. And then, you know, you have a bunch of sutures in your eye and some of they get loose and come out and that hurts and stuff. But I mean, it, I, I was just so grateful. My eyes were kind of healed. I wasn't going to lose my corneas and I could see much, much better, <laughs> you know, than I could before the surgeries. And I felt like I was living a reasonably functional life, but it just wasn't normal. It wasn't pleasant. And then um, in 2012, 10 years ago, the disease started to come back and there were traces of keratoconus coming around the periphery of my cornea. So I had to see this big hotshot guy up in Beverly Hills and he did a number of new surgeries and operations. I'll spare you all the details. And, and then it really, I was seeing the best out of my left eye I'd ever seen. They thought they had mostly healed what was um, kind of jeopardizing the health of the cornea in both eyes. But all of a sudden, the eyes were very, very volatile. I mean, the stigmatism would go up a lot in one eye. Myopia would go up in another, down, up. The, the, the difference between the left and right eye was really a big deal. And, and even in the course of that, I want to, again, interject some gratitude. Because I think most people with a wildly different correction in their left eye from their right eye are really prone to migraines. And, and, and I didn't ever suffer from that. So, you know, I, I think that's a big blessing. But I pretty much really couldn't see much at night. The night vision was was very suboptimal and got to a point where I, I don't drive at night ever. And it was there were severe dry eyes, very, very high light sensitivity. And so there, and they were just I was constantly having to get new glasses, new correction. Really, I would get them at least once a year, but I probably should have been getting them two or three times a year because the vision correction would change so much. And I just kind of learned to live with it. It wasn't great. I'm in front of a computer screen, reading books, reading research, you know, sometimes 16 hours in a day. I'm, um, it's a very different prescription now for when I'm looking at something near versus far. And so you had to adjust around that. And uh, then the right eye for the last six months, I haven't really seen out of my right eye at all. And I, I, no one really could understand why. And there, there's a whole process there. But um, I can see it functionally on my left eye. And even though I put like 50 drops a day in because of dryness and light sensitivity, uh, and sometimes I would get an inflammation in the cornea that would hurt quite a bit. But really, I could see, okay, on my left eye. So that, that was good. But the right eye was not. And um, so my, my eye doctor in California referred me to this specialist in Manhattan and started going through this whole process. And they tried doing a deal where they, and I'm wearing it now, but a special right lens over my right eye, and, and then getting the eye used to that and then putting a correction in that on top of correction in the glasses because there was severe scarring in my right eye. That's why I couldn't see. And even with glasses, if the cornea itself is scarred up, you're not going to see out of it. But the, something about the combination of the contact with the glasses has offset some of the impact from the scarring. And I went from about 20 over 200 vision in my right eye to 20, 30. And that's with correction. Um, so I went from like basically not being able to see it all with correction in the right eye to 20, 30, which is just unbelievable. And so that moment over these last several weeks as I've been going through this treatment and had to see a, a doctor five, six different times in New York, all of a sudden it's like a totally different world, you know? Now I still, I'm going to have to have that scarring probably surgically, uh, uh, you know, dealt with and, and I still have uh, light sensitivity and, and dryness, but all I'm saying is nothing was working. It was just kind of what it was. You get used to it being suboptimal and then all of a sudden it's just night and day different. Okay. If you've, if you've kind of gone through this process with me so far, hopefully you're still here. What does this have to do with midstream energy? Well, it's kind of like this perfect analogy to exactly what's happened in the midstream space. That it's become functional. It's been suboptimal. There's been a lot of bruises and difficulties, but the industry and particularly investing in the industry has puttered along, but not really where people believed it ought to be at some points facing what seemed like an existential crisis, like you could lose your eye, you could lose this sector altogether to various bankruptcies and liquidations and governance challenges and, and, and regulatory challenges. Uh, COVID almost seemed like it would be the final nail in the coffin. 
and then it just started working. Then the next treatment and glasses and contact and, and medical and whatnot, and all of a sudden it's better. And, and that's kind of what happened in midstream. The brief history of the sector was that in concert with the fracking revolution in the United States, the sort of renaissance of U.S. energy produced a need where on one end, we know that the U.S. capacity for production went just exponentially higher um, with crude oil more than doubling, with natural gas nearly doubling per day. Millions of barrels of oil per day, cubic billions of cubic feet of natty gas per day that increased from that. And yet to get from the, the wells where the upstream people reside to the refiners or or two end destinations where the downstream people reside, something has to move it. The oil and gas cannot just get there. And so this midstream sector became vital to the implementation of energy success in our country. And we do put a lot of oil and gas on trucks, and we do put a lot of oil and gas on rail. And that is expensive, and it's uh, cumbersome, and it's slow, and it's not as environmentally um, safe. And, and yet the pipeline industry really uh, became vital. And so you were getting not only great revenues as more and more oil and gas were coming through our pipelines, but you were getting a lot of new pipelines because we had more and more need to move oil and gas and, and kind of create this infrastructure of U.S. energy. And those are the golden years, you know, uh, after the fracking renaissance. And it happened to come just post financial crisis. So it was really blessed timing because our country was reeling economically. And this was the only growth industry out there at the time. Like it was, it was this forward moving, just gazillions of new jobs, new revenues, new opportunity. You have, you know, your kind of peripheral collateral growth that was coming about. And, and it was a glorious thing. And then 2014, late 2014, the Saudis and OPEC just said, okay, we're not, we're not putting up with U.S. shale, any, US shale anymore. This is a, a competitive force that we don't want to have to deal with. And they thought, well, their uh, break-even levels to produce oil are far higher than ours. So we'll cut into our profit margin substantially for the purpose of recapturing market share, but we're gonna we're gonna put these guys under. And they flooded the world with oil, and the U.S. energy sector collapsed in 2015 and 16. And because of capital markets um, innovations in both private equity and private debt, because break-even costs continued to come lower, better technology, better innovation, um, they didn't put U.S. shale under, but they bruised it quite quite severely. And then we kind of bruised ourselves because out of that, all of a sudden we went into this extended period of kind of an ESG extremism, a very strong hostility against financing oil and gas in our own country, uh, a lot of political pressure, a lot of regulatory pressure. There was a presidential administration through the Trump years that was that was friendly to the fossil and industry, but they were fighting against cultural forces, congressional opposition, and and whatnot that was very negative. And and at the same time, I don't think that the energy sector was helping itself a lot either. There was some bad governance, particularly in midstream, general partners that had really unfavorable terms with their limited partners. You had a lot of financial recklessness and uh, overly levered companies, and then they couldn't access equity markets anymore. They couldn't fund growth by issuing new equity, but they certainly weren't going to be able to fund growth with issuing new debt because they were already over levered. And therefore, you couldn't fund any growth, and you were kind of stuck on your balance sheet without access to equity or debt capital. And, and so this was a perfect storm through these years. And you think, wow, that sounds awful. Um, what's the good news? Well, before we get to the good news, then you had the final blow, the death blow that wasn't a death blow, and that was the pandemic. And so you really had a complete and total collapse of demand. And um, the supply needs were so low that transportation of oil and gas went away and the midstream sector looked like it was left for dead. But out of that moment, the analogy to my eyes is someone came up with a new prescription and a new treatment. 
And just as medicine and healthcare, whether you're talking about devices, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, treatments, oncology, all these things that have been really wonderfully advancing and still are, you didn't see nothing yet. That happened with the financial engineering in the U.S. energy sector too. More capital discipline, more reasonable ratios in their distributions, um, completely improved governance. And the sector just came roaring back. From the bottom COVID level, which is a, a difficult, again, it's a cherry picked place, but to make the point, things are up about 160% in, in let's call it a, a two year period. But even just year to date, it's up 25 to 30%, depending on which benchmark you're looking at. In a period of time where broad markets, S&P, NASDAQ are down 15, 20, 25%. So you have come roaring back, and yet yield spreads still indicate incredible value. It isn't like those yield spreads have tightened um, on a historical basis. They're still very wide, which is code for attractive, good value, great cash flow generation, great fundamentals. Now, could this go away again? Could, I have, could there be another setback in the eyes, another reversal, another complexity that requires a whole new surgical treatment and whatnot? Of course there could be. But the main things that are needed right now, I feel very good about. That's a strong capital discipline, um, reasonable ratios and how they distribute uh, uh, dividends to shareholders, and then uh, uh, overall a uh, healthy backdrop to just the broad sentiment of the U.S. energy industry right now. I think that's in early innings. So people are now embracing the idea when you talk about Putin and OPEC and Russia, people are embracing the idea, not just of U.S. having energy independence that was sort of mocked five years ago, but they're saying, um, we want to become a big supplier to the rest of the world. Let's export our natural gas. Let's, li let's liquefy natty gas, put it on ships and send it to Europe and Asia. And so there's a whole engine of growth out there around the midstream sector. It's, an, it's something I believed in for 15 years. It's something I've studied religiously for 12 years. And now it's something that has really, really borne fruit here in this last year, year and a half. And it just kind of happened because it happened. A new set of glasses, a new treatment brought this about. And those fundamentals were important. The, the ups and downs were necessary, but that is the way sometimes these things go with our own health, with my eyes, with the U.S. midstream energy sector. And so we see great value uh, looking ahead. We have great appreciation for what's happened over the last year, year and a half. Um, I'm very proud of the conviction we've maintained and the very astute um, observations of what was happening and needed to happen and how we positioned around that in our own strategy development for investing in this space. And here we are. So I can see you as I'm sitting here uh, taping and hopefully you can hear me and, and understand what, what this analogy is about and why we are so grateful uh, to be uh, invested in the U.S. midstream energy sector and what our plans are in that sector for the foreseeable future. It won't be a smooth ride. There will be more ups and downs, but um, this has been a comeback for the ages, and we're grateful to have seen it. Okay, enough of my puns and analogies. I think you get the point. Thanks so much, as always, for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Please do subscribe if you're not getting it through a feed. It's better for us and better for you if you do it that way. And we encourage you to share it far and wide to others as we continue growing the audience of the Dividend Cafe, trying to share the investment principles we believe in that govern what we do all day, every day at the Bonson Group. Thanks for listening to the Dividend Cafe.